I'm very happy and proud to join all of you today at this May Day gathering. And to all our Muslim friends, Salamat Hari Raya Aidil Fitri. Last year, some of you might remember Brother Chi Ming invited me to say a few words at the rally. This year, he has invited me to speak again, but not just to say a few words, but to give the entire speech. So you see, I too have to learn and upgrade my skills. It, it means more work, because this long weekend, I had no rest. I had to prepare for my speech. But, but it is well worth the effort, and I thank Brother Chi Ming and NTUC for this opportunity to speak to all of you. After fighting COVID for three years, this is our first rally together under Doscon Green. So it's good to see all of you in such high spirit. We all came under tremendous stress over the past three years. Union leaders, workers, and your families. But we never lost our nerve. We came through, we survived, and we emerged from the crisis a better people, stronger and more united than before. NTUC and its unions too are better and stronger. You responded quickly to support our workers in many ways. You reached out to the self-employed and freelancers, administered the SERS scheme for them, and provided them with a much-needed lifeline. When workers lost their jobs, you complemented the government's jobs and skills package with personalized support, helped them with the NTUC care fund, and you enabled them to find new jobs quickly. So I'm proud to stand before you at today's rally to pay tribute to each and every one of you. <clears throat> to all who rallied together and pulled Singapore through this crisis of a generation, I'd like to say a very big thank you. I hope we have put the worst of COVID behind us. And I wish I could tell you that the economic outlook will be rosier. Unfortunately, that is not so. The world today is in dire straits. I know many are worried about Singapore's prospects in this new environment. But just as we found a way through the pandemic, I am confident that we will survive the coming storms. That's provided we stay united and we uphold the same can-do, never-say-die spirit and daring gumption that has seen us through so many previous crises. So today, I will share more about the grim economic landscape before us, how we will respond to these challenges and it, why it's so important and so urgent to strengthen our social compact and our compact with every worker. And I will highlight the importance of strengthening tripartism and the partnership between NTUC and the PAP. For that is the foundation of our economic growth and of the fair and just society we have sought to build over the last six decades. Let me start with the increasingly dangerous and troubled world we live in. Prime Minister Lee described the multiple global storms in Parliament recently. We have hot war in Europe, risk of conflict in Asia-Pacific as a result of growing US-China tensions, as well as protectionism undermining the multilateral trading system. I won't go through each in detail, but I want to explain how these developments will impact us, make it harder for us to compete, to grow our economy, to create jobs, and to earn a living. First, 
the rules of trade are changing. Everyone knows how important trade is to Singapore. And fortunately for us, over the last few decades, countries lowered their tariffs and pursued win-win trade deals. So there was a rise in trade flows globally, and small open trading economies like Singapore prospered. Now, things are changing. Countries no longer talk about win-win cooperation in trade. Many are thinking, I don't want to become over-reliant on you just in case relations turn sour. Some go even further. They think, I not only want to win, I want you to lose. And the value of our trade is more than three times our GDP. We will be hurt if countries, more countries become protectionist and flout trade rules. Second, investment flows are also shifting. Global foreign direct investments, or FDI flows, grew strongly in the past decades as companies established footprints all over the world. They found the best places to do business and linked them up into global supply chains. Singapore has benefited tremendously from this. We built our economy around such global investments. But now this too is changing. Geopolitics is re-channeling FDI flows. And countries talk about nearshoring or friendshoring. And basically it means countries are putting their factories and critical supplies closer to them or in friendly countries they trust. So global FDI flows will slow down and will become more concentrated amongst countries that are geopolitically aligned. Third, the advanced economies are rolling out massive subsidies to build up their own domestic production, especially in strategic industries like semiconductors and clean energy. There is considerable irony in this. Because not so long ago, these very same countries were complaining about what they call harmful tax competition, that governments around the world were undercutting one another with more and more generous tax incentives. So they pushed for a global agreement to stop this tax competition. It is called Base Erosion Profit Sharing or BEPS. Some of you might have heard of this. It includes a global minimum corporate tax of 15% around the world. Everyone sets a minimum corporate tax, 15%. But before this can be implemented, the major economies, US, EU and China, for example, are already rolling out huge subsidies for key projects and investments. Now, if you think about this, Tax incentives and subsidies are all public funds. So it's highly inconsistent to say tax incentives cannot do, but subsidies, yes, let's do more. What's the logic? Unfortunately, we are now in a world where rules are shaped not by logic or principles, but by geopolitics and security imperatives. And Singapore is already feeling the impact. Because when we talk to MNCs here about raising our effective corporate tax rate to 15%, they tell us, yes, we understand, this is happening worldwide. Singapore's incentives used to be best in class. But if your tax rates go up, then Singapore will become less competitive compared to other places. Besides, my home jurisdiction is offering such large subsidies for my next investment. So please tell me what Singapore can offer to persuade my HQ to locate the next investment project here. It's logical for them to say this, right? Because if back home their governments are offering such large subsidies, they will certainly ask us, please match. If not, why should I put my next investment project here? So what this means 
is that competition will be much tougher. I hope all our union leaders understand this and help to explain this to your members. The major economies are mobilizing very large sums of money to build their own strategic industries. Let me just give you one example. Germany is negotiating with Intel to establish a large semiconductor plant in eastern Germany. The deal involves $10 billion in financing support. $10 billion for just one project. $10 billion is almost double what MTI will spend this year to grow our entire economy. Imagine one project and the subsidy promised is double what MTI spends in a year. Can we afford to outbid the big boys, not just the Germans, but also the Europeans, the Americans, the Chinese, the Japanese, outbid all of them for the investments we want? Some politicians go around telling Singaporeans, don't worry, raise corporate tax rates to 15%, you will have lots of revenue, and anyway, we also have lots of reserves, so we can merrily spend more. Unfortunately, they don't understand the magnitude of the challenges we face. So let me tell you plainly, we cannot afford to outbid the big boys just to get the MNCs to invest here. We won't have enough money to match the competition. But what we must have enough of are ingenuity and innovation, guts and, in and gumption. And that's the only way we can and will prevail even when the odds are stacked against us. This is not the first time we've had to respond to such grave challenges. We had a big shock shortly after independence when the British announced in 1968 that they were withdrawing from their military bases here. We've experienced many other economic shocks since then, from oil crisis to financial crisis. We survived each of these critical moments and we turned every challenge into new opportunities. We have no water in Singapore. We develop new water. We have no natural resources. We become a hub for energy and other critical supplies. We don't have enough land. We reclaim land from the sea and we make the most of our limited space with innovative urban solutions. Each time we were pushed to the limit, we did not fold and crumble. Instead, we gritted our teeth, worked even harder to defy the odds and bounced back stronger. That's how we built today's Singapore and that's how we will keep on making it better. COVID-19 has further enhanced our international reputation as a reliable and trusted hub for business. So we must now seize this window of opportunity to make ourselves more competitive and relevant to the world. One strategy is to continue investing in our connectivity infrastructure, and that's why we are pressing ahead with the Changi Terminal 5 and Tuas Port projects. These will significantly enhance our capacity and reinforce our status as a business and logistics hub. Because of these moves, in fact, more MNCs are choosing to anchor their regional and even their global supply chain operations here. For example, VF Corporation a global apparel and footwear company has relocated its Asia product supply hub to Singapore. You may not have heard of VF Corporation, but I'm sure you are familiar with some of its brands, like the North Face and Timberland. And with this shift, more than 70% more than 70% of their global supply is now managed in Singapore.
UPS, the global logistics company, recently announced the expansion of its Changi Hub facility by 25%. It has also invested in its cold chain infrastructure so that it can manage more healthcare shipments like vaccines through Singapore. This will allow UPS to serve more customers in the region, and hopefully all of us will benefit too and get our packages much faster. Another important strategy for us is to deepen our capabilities for innovation, especially in our areas of competitive strengths. And this is why the government is continuing to invest heavily in R&D and innovation, and we are doing this together with leading global companies. For example, Procter & Gamble, the global consumer goods company, has been here for 35 years. And they have deepened their presence here by growing their innovation center to be one of Singapore's largest corporate research facilities. So if you use their products like Pantene, it's a hair product, or Pampers for babies, you can take pride that these were innovated right here in Singapore. Or take another example in semiconductors. We talked about this just now. We can't compete head-to-head -head with the major economies for the most cutting-edge fats because all the big boys want to have the most cutting-edge plants right in their home countries. But we can still find the right niches to operate in and carve out a space for ourselves. And that's why UMC, United Microelectronics Company, is building a new fab here in Singapore for the chips needed in smartphones and electric vehicles. This is happening across all sectors of the economy. I recently met the CEO of a global financial institution. They are re-evaluating their footprint in Asia, and they want to do more out of Singapore. So I asked him, which area are you looking at? He says it's not just about one or two areas, but he wants to make Singapore the hub for knowledge and technology in Asia for his entire institution. And this means a sizable expansion of his headcount in Singapore, which in turn will create more jobs, more opportunities for Singaporeans. And that's why despite the dark clouds, clouds around us, I say, never fear and never lose heart. Singapore may be small, but this little red dot is shining brighter than ever. And if we can keep it shining bright, businesses and investors in the region and beyond will continue to want to come here. The Singapore brand can continue to be a calling card for our people, venturing abroad and for local companies expanding into overseas markets. And if we continue to focus on our strengths and capabilities and find ways to provide value to the world, we can continue to earn a good living and prosper and thrive together. But please, please remember one thing. We cannot take all this for granted. The challenges before us are grave. And yes, we have tremendous assets, but we must continue to be able to work harder and work smarter than others. We must always have that something special that convinces the world that we are a better bet than most and Singapore can always be relied upon to deliver. As we grow the economy, 
we will also fight the ills of inequality. As I said in Parliament recently, Singapore must never succumb to the kind of harsh inequality we see in so many other countries. However treacherous the terrain ahead, so long as Singapore continues to progress, all Singaporeans must continue to progress. No one must be left behind. This is the only way to keep our country together, and that's why we are undertaking the Forward Singapore exercise. And a key aim of this exercise is to refresh and strengthen our compact with workers. The labour movement has this motto, jobs are the best form of welfare. I agree fully with you, but we must expect jobs to change over time. New technologies and more productive ways of doing things will happen and existing jobs will be made obsolete. But new jobs will be created and these will be more productive and higher value added jobs. And that's why in our Forward Singapore review, we are studying how we can invest more in every worker to help them take ownership of their own careers, to continually reskill and upskill and to take up better jobs and opportunities throughout their working lives. We've been working on this for some time under Skills Future, but we will shift Skills Future to higher gear and make skills training and lifelong learning a key pillar of our refreshed compact with every worker. We will pay special attention to those in vocational and technical roles, and especially our ITE and Polytechnic graduates. We will help them deepen their skills through different pathways so they can secure better salaries and career paths in the professions they have trained for and have the aptitude for. Take the example of Brother Dixon Tong. I think he's here with us today in this room. I met Brother Dixon recently. He has been working at Hitachi as a lift technician for the past 25 years. And throughout this period, he has been continually honing his skills to excel in his profession. Recently, he took up a work-study diploma program. It was not easy for him to go back to work, to school after more than 20 years while working at the same time. But with hard work and determination, he attained his diploma and was promoted to a supervisory role in the company. Dixon received the Model Worker Award last year and has been nominated for the Comrade of Labour Award this year. Congratulations, Dixon. PMEs too will have to reskill and upskill themselves, especially with rapid technological advancements. For example, look at what's happening in AI, artificial intelligence. Some of you may have used ChatGPT. I asked ChatGPT, what should I say in my May Day rally speech? It didn't give me a good answer, so I had to write my speech myself. But in time to come, the AI algorithms will only get better and more versatile. And ChatGPT is just one application of AI. Many more are on the way. Integrating new technologies like AI into our work will bring sweeping changes, including for highly trained workers. We must expect more human tasks to be taken over by machines. So some existing skills will no longer be so useful, but new skills will be needed. And that's why we must continually reskill and upskill. One example is Madam Amina Muhammad La. She is someone who has taken the plunge to learn new IT skills. After 20 years working in administrative roles like finance and procurement, she enrolled in a nine-month program to learn about coding, data science, and data visualization. 
something completely new for her. And she struggled with it initially. But fortunately, her children were also taking up courses in computing and data science at the same time. So she could discuss and get some help from them. This is the circle of life. When we are children, we learn from our parents. As we get older, the young ones will teach us. And so through her hard work, she has now embarked on a new career as a business analyst at one of our banks. Well done, Amina. Dixon and Amina are both inspiring examples. We salute them for their passion in lifelong learning. We want many more workers to follow their lead. But we also know that it is very hard to juggle work and family responsibilities while studying at the same time. So we will reduce the cost and lower the barriers to training. We will work closely with NTUC and all of you as our key partners in, endeavor, in this endeavour and support every worker in your journey of lifelong learning. There are other issues we are looking at in our Forward Singapore review. Some are issues that NTUC has been championing. There's also feedback and ideas from the NTUC's Every Worker Matters conversations, as Tech Jen said just now. For example, what more can we do to uplift our lower wage workers, professionalize skilled trades, and ensure dignity and respect for every job, for every worker? How can we provide more support for those who lose their jobs to redu reduce the strain on their finances and at the same time help them upskill and get back into work and bounce back stronger? How can we enable all workers to meet their retirement needs and enjoy peace of mind in their golden years? As well as many other issues you can see from the booth outside where they have a Every Worker Matters showcase around career guidance for young people, caregiving, support for platform workers, and many other issues. We are looking at, into all of these issues and working closely with NTUC on possible solutions so that we can provide good jobs and opportunities and better assurance to all our workers. Of course, I understand workers are concerned about other things besides careers and jobs. In particular, many are worried about the cost of living. And that's why I have implemented comprehensive support measures, including in this year's budget. These measures will help to cover the inflation-induced spending, in other words, the increase in spending due to inflation for lower and middle-income households. Some support has already been given out, like the CDC vouchers. I think some of you will say, already spent, right? Used up completely already, especially the vouchers for supermarket. But don't worry, more help is on the way. These are already announced, huh? <laughs> but it's worth reiterating because people forget. We have top-ups for children later this month, utilities and SNCC rebates every quarter, and for all adult Singaporeans, all adult Singaporeans, cash payouts of up to $2,000 So, in other words, everyone, adult Singaporean, will get something, but the more vulnerable groups, especially our seniors and lower income individuals, will receive more.
So we have done everything we can to lessen the stresses and strains that people feel on the ground, and we will continue to do so. One specific concern that people have is housing. And the main problem we face today is insufficient BTO flats because our supply was impacted by delays caused by COVID. We are steadily catching up on the backlog, ramping up supply and building more BTO flats. This year alone, we are completing 20,000 flats. So we will get this done and we will deliver the results. Despite these efforts, I know some still worry about the affordability of HDB flats. I met one union leader who told me, in the 80s, a four-room flat was only $40,000. Now you have to add one more zero. Uh, uh, BTO prices are more expensive. So he said, if this trend continues, how will my children afford their own homes in the future? I explained to him why he doesn't have to worry, so let me do so here again with all of you. You know, in Singapore, the Prime Minister has to be a real estate agent. So I'm learning and brushing up my skills, and I will use this occasion to practice. When you think about affordability, please don't just look at the headline price of the BTO flat. Also consider how the price relates to income as well as the proportion of income that's needed to service the housing loan. Then you have a complete picture of affordability. What does it look like? In 1980, the price of a four-room BTO flat in a new town at that time indeed was around 40000 But back then, the median household income was around $900. And the typical household would use about a quarter of their income to service the loan. One quarter of the income to service the loan. What's the situation today? Take the price of a four-room flat in a non-mature estate like Bukit Batok, recently launched. It's about $350,000. So yes, prices have risen nearly 10 times since 1980, but the median household income has risen 10 times too, from $900 in 1980 to $9,000 today. So BTO flat prices have in fact moved in tandem with incomes. And what I've described does not even include the housing grants, because we give up up to $80,000 of grants for first-timers, which make the flats more affordable for them. So, if you do a proper comparison, a fair comparison, BTO flats remain affordable. The typical household now continues to use less than 25% of their income to service the loan, like in 1980. And the vast majority of our first-time home buyers today service their housing loans through their CPF contributions with very little or even no out-of-pocket cash. This is what we are doing today and this is what we will continue to do in the future to ensure affordable public housing. So, brothers and sisters, affordable and accessible public housing, like access to first-rate education and health care, will always be a key part of our social compact in Singapore. We have done this in the past, and we've created the world's best public housing. You go anywhere in the world, name me any country that has the same quality of public housing that we do. There is none. Now we are continuing to provide affordable and quality public housing to Singaporeans 
And as long as the PAP remains in charge, we will ensure quality public housing that is affordable and accessible for our children and future generations. This is what we stand for. The government will always strive for a fairer and more equal society and for the well-being of every worker. That conviction is in our DNA. It's in the DNA of both the PAP and the NTUC. And so long as we continue to work together to keep faith with one another, we will achieve our shared goals. And this brings me to my final point, which is the centrality of tripartism and the PAP and TUC partnership. Tripartism, that's our secret recipe, our secret formula. It is one of our greatest and most sustainable competitive advantages. I mentioned just now the 10 billion subsidy Germany is offering Intel to invest in the country. We cannot afford to match them. We can't afford the same scale of subsidies. But we have something that's worth much more, a tripartite structure that is in working order and effective. That's worth many times more than $10 billion. So let us cherish and guard this precious inheritance and make it even better. Because we can just look at what's happening in so many other developed first world nations where industrial relations have broken down. In France, there have been riots and strikes since January this year because of anger over the government's plan to raise the retirement age. In the UK, unions went on strike to protest slow wage growth and it's affected a lot of public services. I've cited two examples in two countries, but you see similar labour action in many other places. And businesses and governments will push back, fueling deep divisions in society. Then it becomes a vicious cycle because once trust is lost, it's very hard to recover. We must never allow this to happen here. Fortunately, Singapore is on the right track. We have a lot going for us, and our tripartite approach ensures that Team Singapore has the best chance of overcoming challenges and seizing new opportunities. The basis for our tripartism is the symbiotic partnership between NTUC and the PAP. We are sibling organisations. We originated from the same movement and we share the same objectives to improve the lives of workers and Singaporeans, to promote economic growth for all and ensure social cohesion and stability. And that's why through good times and bad, workers and unions have supported the PAP and the PAP in turns works closely with the NTUC to implement pro-worker laws and policies and ensures that NTUC has the resources to look after our workers. That's why in our rallies, we participate in each other's rallies. You have in a May Day rally our comrades from the PAP and in a PAP rally our brothers and sisters from the unions. And when we come together for rallies like this, we affirm this special relationship when we say together in one voice, Majula NTUC, Majula PAP, and Majula Singapura. At a personal level, I've had the joy and privilege of working closely with many brothers and sisters in the labour movement. 
My own ties with the union started more than 15 years ago when I was at EMA. I engaged our union leaders at UPage regularly and got to know many of them, including the late brother Nachi and the present leaders, brother Samad and Seng Chai. And since then, I've gotten to know many other union leaders. I deeply appreciate and thank all of you for your friendship. To all of you and to all our brothers and sisters in the labour movement, I want to tell you that you can always count on my support and friendship as we chart our new way forward together. In these dark times, this is my promise to you. The 4G team and I are fully committed to look after our workers, to protect your interests and help you earn a better living and live a better life. The 4G team and I are fully committed to our partnership with the NTUC and the labour movement to work closely with you and to secure sustained growth and good jobs for all Singaporeans. Come what may, we will always be there with you for you, and we will always have your back. And that's why we say solidarity forever. May, happy May Day, everyone. Thank you, sir.